Good evening, everyone. I want to welcome everyone out here today for the Curtis County uh, Monday, February 15th Board of Commissioners meeting. And um, we have a lot of uh, distinguished guests in our audience tonight. And uh, the first order of business is we have no one signed up for the invocation of Pledge of Allegiance. I'd ask anybody in the audience would love to come up and do the uh, invocation and Pledge of Allegiance in the audience. Any? If not, I will um, ask um, if Ms. Jar uh, Ms. Jarvis would like to do that for us tonight. <clears throat> Dear Lord, thank you so much for the, pr the freedom to come here to this place to do the work of the people. I ask that you be with us tonight, guide us, and help us make decisions that are pleasing to your will, and direct us to be good servants of the people. I ask that you be with our distinguished guests and others here tonight, and our commissioners as we travel home tonight in this terrible weather uh, to be safe. Uh, until we can meet again. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Commissioner Jarvis, for that. The next item is the approval of the agenda. Do we have any changes to the agenda tonight? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would like to add to our closed session um, uh, the following. Uh, and pursuant to GS 143-318.11A6 to discuss a personnel matter. Okay, thank you. Any other changes? Okay, do I have a motion for approval? A motion to second. Any further discussion? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. The next uh, item is public comment. <clears throat> I do not have anyone signed up for public comment. Is there anyone in the audience that would like to to um, speak or come up and say anything in public comment? Okay, hearing none, I'm going to close public comment, <clears throat> and we're going to get into the commissioner's report. And I will start off to my right, if I may, and start with Commissioner Etheridge. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be very brief. Uh, we lost a good person from Mayock uh, Saturday night in a traffic accident. Samuel, who owned the El Portrillo restaurant, was killed on his way home. I just ask that everybody uh, keep his family in your prayers. And um, he came to Moyak. I met him before he opened the restaurant and got to know him over the years. And he always said, see you tomorrow when you left. And uh, we, we will see him tomorrow one day. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, ditto to what um, Commissioner Etheridge said. Uh, Sam, such a great guy in the community, liked by everybody. Um, Prayers to his family and the restaurant and everybody. Um, COVID clinics, they're still going on. Follow the county website. Follow the county Facebook page. Follow Albemarle Regional Health Services. Feel free to call our chairman, not 24 hours a day, because he's the, uh, the seat on the uh, Albemarle Regional Health Services. Today we did about 840 shots. Um, the clinics are running great. Everybody's thankful. Got a good system, good program. Uh, kudos to everybody involved with it. Last week, I do want to give an appreciation to a local business, Curry Tuck Barbecue. Um, the county's been buying lunch for the staff that um, is working the clinics in the rain and the cold and the pretty much, you know, brutal weather, the wind. And yeah, last week, when the lunch was picked up from Curry Tuck Barbecue, they did not take payment. Um, they fed roughly 40 people. I mean, I thought that was really, really nice of a local business with the times as Brutal as some of the stuff is from COVID, you know, restaurant businesses are one business that took a major hit because they couldn't be open for a while. So uh, big shout out to those guys. Uh, support them. Support the Mexican restaurant in Moyake as well as in Grandy uh, to support uh, Sam's family. And that's it for me. Um, I, too, uh, am going to sorely miss Sam. It was um, a cheerful face. And it was always pleasant to uh, to talk to him, uh, especially after uh, yet another uh, 
meal eaten in this restaurant. So that that's sad. Uh, that is all I have. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I will uh, just want to talk about the, um, the vaccines and the COVID uh, clinics we've been having. Um, today was a good day. We've been getting a lot of um, feedback from the community, uh, social media, emails, all positive. How great of a job that we're talking to staff, the Sheriff's Department, EMS. They've been doing a fantastic job with ease of getting in, getting out. Um, it's even it's even, uh, believe it or not, uh, the news outlet from out of our area have even commented. We got feedback of uh, how well Curtis Duck has been doing and putting on your clinics. So uh, that says a lot for the county staff, the Alamo Regional Health, uh, the Sheriff's Department, it's just all around. Just you know, a lot of good uh, congratulations to you had up there playing along with that. Um, another update is. Every uh, every three weeks, the uh, Alamo Regional Health gets an outlook of how many vaccines we're going to get. So this Thursday, or maybe Friday, we will be getting a um, a three week outlook of how many doses we'll be getting. Um, the director will know and let us know. So then the Ben with the county manager can plan accordingly with the amount of doses we're going to get. So we really don't know um, until uh, till this week what the three weeks going to look like. And lastly, on the current latest numbers for Currituck County, uh, the latest as of today for the cases, there's been Currituck County is at 1,267 confirmed cases. Active cases currently are at 90. Recovered cases are 1,164. And Currituck has 14 deaths associated with COVID. Um, those are the latest numbers as of today. Um, the reports still are that the hospitalizations are going down, which is a good sign. It's trending in a positive way. So um, just keep up everything that you're doing. Um, be respectful of others, and um, the shots will be going on as long as we have them. And that is all I have for today. So, Commissioner White. Uh, thank you, sir. Um, turn on mic. Not much to see them for myself. Uh, we did get a. Put a shot in the arm. We pretty much all knew that we were uh, one of the most luxurious summer destinations, <laughs> but uh, uh, we were ranked uh, number six out of uh, ten, pretty uh, pretty high on the list. Uh, Hamptons is up there, and Nantucket and uh, Montauk, New York, and so uh, uh, just wanted to say that's great. Looking forward to 2021. Those kind of things go great for us. Uh, um, and helping push business this way. They come out right at the right time of the year, seemingly, too. And the last time I remember something like this happening was uh, 1996, and uh, that was when uh, USA Today said this is one of the top ten retirement destinations, and that was right about the time the uh, everybody's pulling money out of the stock market, out of the technology section, and we ended up where we're at today with the building boom that took place in Kerala, and the rest is history. Um, did receive a call today about their Corolla recycling, and uh, you know nothing's changed there. We are looking to get 250 people uh, involved, or at least Bayside is 250 people signed up, and then they will uh, they can be, they can it's financially doable for them to provide the service. Um, one of the things we can do if any HOA uh, people are out there is maybe the HOAs can get in touch with their homeowners that are interested in being involved in that and get that list together. The county is working with Bayside, and we are trying to compile that data uh, to them and um, so they can figure out a price. I was asked about prices specifically. We don't know what that's going to be. It does vary depending on the number of people that jump onto the recycling program. So if you're interested in it, um, you can contact the county or, uh, like I said, if you're, if you're in an HOA on the Outer Banks and you're uh, interested Maybe um, get with them and see if they could reach out to people. They have access probably to most homeowners within their HOAs, um, and they can maybe facilitate getting some more people signed up. And that's it for me this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner White. Commissioner Etheridge. No, Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> Lastly, Commissioner Jarvis. Thank you. Um, I would like to congratulate the uh, College of the Albemarle's uh, Associate Nursing Program for being rated number one in North Carolina in the 2021 edition of the top ranked nursing schools uh, in North Carolina at registerednurse.org. COA placed first out of 82 schools in our state. So congratulations to the hundreds of nursing students that uh, have 
uh, graduates that they've had, the current students that are thriving in the program and volunteer, volunteering, giving shots. Uh, Dean Robin Harris, department chair Katie Miller, and all of her faculty and staff. And Ms. Etheridge and I had the uh, pleasure of touring the public safety building this week, uh, despite the cold rain, mud, and muck. Um, and that building is going to be such an asset to our county, um, their overall, the overall safety and health of our county, uh, from the offices to the classrooms to the incredible technology. I was completely impressed by the scope of that building and look forward to hopefully opening this summer if the rain will ever stop. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Jarvis. Next is our county manager's report. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, just wanted to, to remind folks out there that uh, the board had its retreat a little over a week ago. It was a three-day retreat. I thought it was very successful. We covered a lot of different topics and a, a wide breadth of subject matter. Um, I encourage the public to continue to watch um, all of the traditional methods of communication that the county has. You know, we'll be putting out press releases about initiatives that come out of that. We'll be um, putting things on social media. Uh, one of the things that we're going to strive to do over the next year is to start to publish some short videos to try to inform the citizens about what the county does, what the departments do, uh, just so that we've got a, a, a wider range of knowledge out in our citizenry. Um, and that's all I have this evening, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Stikeleather. Uh, the next item on the agenda is administrative reports. And we have a, uh, you know, a, a special uh, individual in our audience tonight, the, uh, the Honorable Judge J. Carlton J.C. Cole, who is retiring from Superior, uh, the Superior Court. And we'd like to recognize him tonight. And if I could ask him to come up to the front along with our sheriff and our clerk of court, please. And we have something to present him tonight. We have a resolution for you for your years of service and everything you've done for the community in this area. We'd like to present this, and I'm going to go ahead and read this resolution. This resolution, honoring Superior Court Judge J. Carlton J.C. Cole upon his retirement as resident Superior Court Judge for the 1st Judicial District of North Carolina. Whereas Judge J. Carlton J.C. Cole is retiring in March 2021 and stepping down from the bench after serving 15 years as district court judge and 12 years as res resident superior court judge for the first judicial district of North Carolina, ending a notable tenure. And whereas Judge Cole is a native son of Aswatank County, North Carolina, and began at an early age to prepare for a lifetime of public and community service, attending public schools in Aswatank County, graduating from Livingstone College with a major in mathematics and serving as a United States <laughs> Navy reservist, United States Postal Inspector, and private investigator prior, prior to earning his master's degree and Juris Doctorate from North Carolina Central University School of Law in 1987. And whereas following his 1987 admission to the North Carolina State Bar, Judge Cole entered a private practice of law until his appointment by Governor James B. Hunt, Jr. to the District Court bench in 1994, an appointment receiving a claim so widespread that the ceremony to swear in Judge Cole was held on the front lawn of the McQuimans County Courthouse because the courtroom was too small for the crowded attendance. And whereas Judge Cole served as a district judge until his appointment by Governor Beverly Perdue to the Supreme Court bench in 2009, where he continued to serve after election in 2010 and re-election in 2018. And whereas Judge Cole, Cole's service as a judge is notable for the care, attention, and respect he gave to parties appearing before him, especially young at-risk defendants, he would speak with about their education future and second chances followed by a step down from the bench to offer a hug as a sign of support and encouragement. And whereas despite his busy professional life, Judge Cole has been active in his community and church and as alumnus of his beloved Livingstone College about <coughs> Ritchie State, 
stated in 2018 Founders Day Address, I quote, I understand the importance of this great institute in my life, my development, God first, but Livingstone second. And where, unquote, and whereas after 27 years of distinguished service, Judge Cole leaves <coughs> undemptable mark on the judiciary and the people of Northeastern North Carolina and will forever be remembered as a determined, concerned, just, and caring public servant. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Curtis County Board of Commissioners expresses his gratitude to Judge J. Carl J. C. Cole for his dedication and service and congratulates him and wishes him happiness and peace in his retirement, adopted this 15th day of February 2021. I'd like to say just a few words about Judge Cole. What can you say? He, he is irreplaceable. His strong, steady leadership in our first judicial district is irreplaceable. Um, Judge Cole's held wears many hats, mentor, especially to the youth, but to the clerk staff and all judicial staff, officers of the court, uh, confidant, at times counselor, um, and just, just a good friend. He is going to be missed, and he, he, he is so beloved by my staff. My, my entire staff is here to support him and recognize him, even some retired staff. It's called um, he is just so accommodating and willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. Judge Cole, when he's on the bench, he commands respect in that courtroom. He doesn't even have to say anything. He can give you that look, <laughs> and the hair on the back of your neck will stand up, and you know you better straighten up. Um, really, just to break it all down, he is just good people. He's, Judge Cole is a kind, caring, compassionate, decent, loving human being, and gentle, we love you. I want to say the General Assembly, um, in their wisdom, created a law, it's a general statute, that forces judges to retire when they turn 72 years old. And sometimes that's a good thing. But with Judge Cole, you still got it. <laughs> Yes, very simply, I like to say that Judge Cole is the most respected person that I've ever known. He has been a great friend and is a great friend to law enforcement and to Curtis County. And one thing that probably describes him better uh, than anyone I've ever known is the term that we use in addressing him is your honor, because he certainly deserves it. God bless you and thank you. My first experience as a plane when I met Judge Cole when I was 20 years old. I don't know if you remember this. I was a 20 year old college student who missed grand jury. And I came in there with a clerk of court. And Judge Cole smiled at me and I said, That sounds nice. He's not going to do anything. I thought it was good. I made a little joke. Judge Cole, uh, that smile turned to a frown in about two seconds. I paid that fine for missing grand jury as a 20 year old. And um, he's, he's fair, though. Uh, he's a phenomenal individual. His wife, Judge Cole, as well. Janice Cole, they're great people. They're as quality as they come in this world. Uh, good luck in your retirement. If she gives you a tour of this, Judge you better make sure you're done. <laughs> um, and like I said, he just, um, you know, and if you have court from now until he's still here, do not wear jeans in this courtroom because you will get sent out. You will get sent out. Back in December of 2008, I had won re-election along with three other guys that were coming on the Board of Commissioners. And we asked Judge Cole, would he come swear us in? And he did us a great honor that night by coming over here and doing that. And I'll always appreciate that and be eternally grateful, sir. God bless you.
to chair it. I, uh, I accept this on behalf of these folk, the courtroom staff, the other persons, even though my name is on it. They're the ones that helped me through these situations, their support, their love. Dad and Kathy back there <laughs> fought me when I first came on the bench. <laughs> and they were telling me they're, what they were saying. Well, Judge Janice Cole didn't do it this way. <laughs> <laughs> So I had to uh, learn to do it the way that they wanted me to do it. And I thank each and every one of you for coming out tonight to support. You know, this is not about one person. We're all in this together. This criminal justice system that we're in, we have to do everything we can to make it as fair and just as we can. Uh, the good Lord allowed me to be here. But he had me understand that that position of judge does not mean anything. It's about serving the good folk of this judicial district and this great state of ours. Eternally thankful for all of you. You did enough of this little country boy <laughs> from the bottom of Wheat School. His father dropped out of school in the third grade, mom in the eighth grade. And that's why I stress religion, not religion, education so much. Because if we can get our young kids to get an education, we can make this whole world a better place. I got my rabbit hunting buddies here with me tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I just thank all of and please, uh, Mr. McCoy, you, I'm glad you mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> I would not dare uh, leave this without acknowledging my beautiful wife, who I replaced on the bench. She told me that the least that you say, the better off you are. <laughs> <laughs> and I have kept that counsel again. The board of her, you've always been special to me. I've always enjoyed doing the court here. And her, you're just amazing people. And I thank you again for taking or recognizing this again, my name is on it, but I accept it on behalf of all of these folks. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a couple minute recess if we could in case anybody needs. I know uh, Honorable uh, Judge Cole may have to leave, and but we'll take like a five minute recess just to kind of let people need to go that have to. It's pretty, pretty vacant now, but <laughs> we'll go ahead and uh, reconvene our scheduled meeting here. We have more lawyers in the crowd than we have. <laughs> Um, uh, with that, uh, the next item uh, is the Game Commission report. Uh, the attorney, William Rumsey, the, I can't read my own writing fourth. here, fourth. <laughs> and Commission Chair Andy Sh Schilling. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> Couldn't read the writing there. All right. Thank um, you. Yeah, I'm Bill Brumsey, uh, William Brumsey IV. I'm the attorney for the Game Commission. Appreciate you guys having us. Appreciate Ben asking us to come and talk a little bit. Um, 
It's not going to be quite as exciting as Judge Cole's uh, event, but we'll do our best here. And, and don't what we'll say yourself. about Judge Cole is exactly correct. He's a he's a an asset to northeastern North Carolina, and I, I agree with everything that was said. And also, um, comment on the vaccines. I, I very much appreciate the work that all the agencies have done. Got received my second shot today. Caught a glimpse of McCord while I was there, and all the agencies have. Uh, done a very good job, and I've I've heard the same from uh, many people that have done it, and uh, some people from out of the area are just amazed with the efficiency that it's running here. So we certainly appreciate everything that all these agencies are doing. All right, the uh, game commission right now. I'm just going to go over the current members. The uh, district one is represented by Ardell Lee Waterfield. District 2 is Jason Belanger. District 3 is Jeremy Evans. District 4 is Robert Rom. District 5 is Trevor Old. Jim Kaysen is an at-large member, and Andy Schilling is an at-large member, and he's also the chairman. The clerk to the commission is Cindy Scott, and the website for the Game Commission is currytuckgamecommission.com. So there's a lot of information on the website. You, you guys, and anybody in the audience that wants more information on the on the game commission can go to that website for a pretty good rundown of everything that we have going on. So what we're going to do tonight is I'm just going to go over some of the basics with the game commission and answer any questions that you guys might have, and then uh, Mr. Schilling will also give a presentation and answer any questions that you might have. First, the 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 Game Commission is authorized by uh, the Chapter 1436 of the North Carolina Session Law of 1957. And the first section of that session law uh, lays out the framework. And that says the hunting, shooting, killing, or trapping of any wildfowl consisting of geese, ducks, brant, or any other wildfowl from shore, marsh, blind, or floating device on or adjacent to the public orders of Curry Tuck County shall be governed and regulated by the North Carolina Wildlife Commission and a duly constituted appointed game commission of Prairie Tuck County is here and after set forth subject to the following regulations. And then the regulations follow that. And the session law also gives the commission the authority to enact rules to govern the issuance of the various blinds that we that we uh, administer to. So there's really two bodies of regulations. The first is the session law, and then the second are the rules that are established by the Game Commission pursuant to the session law. The uh, number of blinds that we attend to, well, there, there's three types of blinds. There's stationary bush blinds, there are point blinds, and there are float blinds. So we have, currently we have 351 stationary bush blinds, we have 459 point blinds and 85 float blinds, so a total of 895 blinds that we administer to every year. Some of the key rules and regulations that we deal with most frequently are the application fees. So currently, the application fees for a bush blind or float blind are $35 for a North Carolina resident. $260 for a non-resident, and then all point blind applications are $35, and that's per year. So each year, these blind applications get renewed, and, and each applicant pays, pays that uh, based on uh, that criteria. Uh, blinds must be 500 yards from other blinds, uh, location rule. Float blinds cannot tie within, within 300 yards of any residents when they, when they tie out. Uh, for the day, and each blind, each uh, each stationary blind and point blind must be built every year up to the current current standards of the commission, and they have to be reported as being complete to the commission. And we just we just changed that this year. I think it worked a little better. They were being called in uh, when the blinds were complete this year. They the uh, completed blinds are being emailed in, which works a little better, gives us more of a trail to trace the completions, and frankly, it's just easier from an administrative standpoint as well. The, there is a 420 law that's in place, and that uh, over the years has garnered 
some attention and I've gotten some calls on it recently. You may be hearing a little bit more about it, but the, the 420 law is a law that splits the county based on geography as to when the hunting can, must stop uh, on a given day. So there's a line that runs along the intercoastal waterway starting at the Virginia line, <clears throat> runs down the center of the intercoastal, and then hits the northern tip of Church's Island, runs uh, along Water Lily Road out to 168, and then, excuse me, 158, and then follows 158 south to the Dare County line. So that's the line of demarcation. On the east side of that line, the quitting time for all hunting during the season is 420. On the west side of that line, the quitting time is sunset, which aligns with what the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission uh, lays out. So uh, 420 on the east side of that line, sunset on the west side of the line. Um, and then the important thing to remember is that any of the decisions that the Game Commission makes on anything can be applied, can be appealed to district court for a de novo hearing if someone's aggrieved by a, a Game Commission decision. This year we had, um, out of all the applications, we had six, six cases uh, that were appealed to district court. Five of those were pretty straightforward, just a, an inadvertent miss of a deadline. And then the six was a contested matter between, really between two parties that didn't, didn't technically involve the game commission, but the, the district court uh, ruled and, and ruled the same as the game commission ruled at the game commission level. Our budget um, for 2019-2020, which is last year we've had audited at this point, the Game Commission took in $40,817 from those license fees that we laid out at the, at the beginning. And that number can vary depending on the uh, number of available blinds and also the location and the desirability of available blinds. So if you have a very desirable blind available in a given year, you may have a hundred applicants for that one blind. Or if you have a float blind that becomes available, you may have more than a hundred applicants, a very large number of applicants for a float blind. So uh, our income is really based on the number and the desirability of the blinds that are available in a given year. Expenditures for this upcoming budget year, 2021, we have uh, budgeted $30, $39,000 in expenditure. So uh, just a little bit less than the, uh, the amount generated by the license fees in the prior year. Uh, and basic expenditures that we have each year for commissioners, attorney's fees, and uh, the amount that we pay to the North Carolina Wildlife Commission, that doesn't change in a given year. Uh, we know basically what those are. And then um, we have, uh, in recent history, we've been uh, giving some of the money that's generated from the license fees. Uh, we've, we've been giving $2,000 to the Ducks Unlimited Green Wing Program, which is a youth program for youth hunters. And then uh, this budget year, we're also giving $7,000 to the, uh, it's a, it's a to the Curry Tuck shooting team and a uh, youth hunt that the uh, Curry Tuck shooting team does there at the high school. Okay. All right. Any questions for me about anything that I've just gone over? The last time y'all gave a report, there was some discussion about the blinds that are not being kept up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a topic that uh, gets brought up uh, with some regularity amongst the amongst the game commissioners and, and the general public. So you have, uh, yeah, if Andy wants to speak That was on actually that. one of the things I was gonna address. So okay. this is my first year as chairman of the Curtha County Game Commission and I appreciate getting put in that position. I agree. Uh, really appreciate being placed on the commission and that the other commissioners selected me as the chairman. One of the things, one of the things that I really wanna focus on is, well, as far as a report for this season, for those of you who don't duck hunt, um, as has been the case for a number of years, there are not as many ducks here as there used to be. So 
Uh, it was a better year this year than in some of the past. I talked to several guys and uh, a number of other hunters just to get their input, just to see if their seasons were the same as mine. So the early part of the season was better this year than it has been for the past several years. And as we've seen for the last several years, it kind of declined in January. We finally got some cold weather, but unfortunately got 30 mile an hour winds with it that made it difficult to hunt in a lot of areas. This week would have been great for hunting, but we don't have any control over the calendar and the season set by the federal government. So, um, but we, we do have an increasing amount of people who are interested in duck hunting and a limited amount of ducks to hunt. So there are a lot of blinds that are unused every year. And these blinds, a lot of people sort of take an ownership feel to more like that's my blind. Or, and that's obviously not the way it is. The blinds belong to the county. And does everyone understand the difference between a stationary blind and a point blind and a flip blind. So, so the, really the ones that, although there are 895 blinds that we administer, there's only really 351, I think, that are stationary blinds that routinely come up. If a flip blind comes up, that's a pretty rare occasion. Um, for some reason, people hold on to them. And uh, the stationary blinds are the ones that you see out in the sound if you're out boating and you're wondering why there's a bunch of sticks out there in the water that are an obstruction in navigation. So uh, we are going to try. It, Historically, these things have been policed by other hunters. So if somebody saw one of those blinds and wanted to have that blind, then they would apply for it. And that's how we would discover which blinds were not being built. Uh, it, there's 351, is that right? Correct. The commissioners aren't going to ride around and take a look at all of them. It's just not logistical. So um, what we have done this year is doing, instead of the prior system of having everybody call in to bill, as you can imagine. Uh, so you had to take 351 phone calls every year of, that their blinds were built. We, you know, it is 2020. So we decided to use email that when you finished your blind, you would go ahead and email a report into the commission so we would have a record of it. Many times people would come to the hearings and say, I did call. And Mr. Brumsey back was saying, I, I didn't receive a call. And so we would have a dispute over whether or not the phone call was actually made. Now we have an email, so we have a record of that. Um, <clears throat> I would like to see, but I don't speak for the whole commission on this, that photographs be taken of the blinds. So after you build it, you take a picture of it, send it in, so we have no dispute over whether the blind was built. We have a lot of blinds that are um, never built, or haven't been built in many years, and we have more people who are applying, but they don't know the system or the process. So education about the process for applying for blinds and a more objective set of rules that everyone can follow to apply for those blinds will hopefully reduce the number of sticks that you see in the water that used to be blinds about 15 years ago and haven't been hunted for a long time. So that's a goal of mine as the chairman of the, of the commission. These, these blinds are there for public use and they should be used. Thank you for the pictures. That's, I'll do my best. So um, how many um, blinds are you going to get that are going to look exactly like <laughs> Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> that imagery online, All right. 15 bucks. All right, right. The interesting part about that is the backdrop. We had an issue this year where someone tried to put on a picture of a blind that they allegedly had built right next to mine, ironically. Um, but it had the Curtha County Lighthouse in the background, which meant that it was uh, like 10 to 15 miles too far north and, uh, or too far south rather, and um, on the wrong side of the south. So other than that, it was a perfect <laughs> Jersey Shores back there. So I, I will tell you that some of the kids I coached back in, in uh, football, back in the high school, uh, went through the whole process and, you know, documented a blind and they went through, you know, and uh, they were, I could tell you leading up to the appearance in court, because it was challenged in court, the blind they were after was from a group out of Raleigh, and they were not happy that these young whippersnappers had, and um, they came back going, you know, it, it was legit, and it, it, I mean, you know, they kept thinking, okay, we don't know something, and it's going to hit us bad, but they put in the work, they did the research, and, and, and the Game Commission did an outstanding job of taking care of them and making sure that they felt part of Curtuck County. And that was the, the one uh, contested case that was between two parties and it ended up being resolved in, in district court. And Judge Meter Harris is the judge on that, yep. was the judge on that. And he's, he's a hunter and he's taken some interest in these cases, which is good. Uh, in the past, some district court judges have not been real excited about having to familiarize themselves with the Curry Tuck County Game Commission 
rules, but Judge Judge Harris is great, does a good job of, of ciphering through that. And one of the, one of the things that I I always try to stress is that this is a public open process, and that the case that you're speaking of is is that in a nutshell, and that was. Um, you know, it played out like it was supposed to play out. Everyone had an opportunity to be heard, and uh, probably the correct decision was made based on the facts. That they had a great year. Yeah, yeah. Well, that I was uh, the great year. That was uh, uh, that blind that they that they were in for. I think was a pretty good location. So. And just on behalf of the commission, I want to give kudos to Mr. Brumsey for the outstanding work he does. Basically, the commission wouldn't work or get any of its jobs done. If, if he didn't take it. So, I mean, I've been on the outside observing the commission in the past and know the work that he's done, but now that I'm sitting on it, uh, it's an integral part, and we would not be able to accomplish anything without his assistance. Excellent. Well, I appreciate that. As, as Judge Cole said, it's more the the members that do all the work, and I don't make any decisions, so it's... Uh, well, we do a lot of talking, and he actually does a lot of work. <laughs> we all must be doing something right, because in my previous time on this board, I got as many calls about the game commission and what they were doing wrong, <laughs> and it's been relatively quiet. Well, we, we have our moments, but it's, um, uh, Curry Tuck, there are some emotions run high when it comes to duck hunting, for sure, and, and rightfully so. I thought we were going to have a fight in here one night over an issue. Curry Tuck's one of two game commissions in the state, correct? That's right. Us uh, in Dare County. That's right. And, and Dare has some similar rules, but um, it's not their set of rules is, is much shorter, not quite as detailed. And I get some calls occasionally from Dare County folks inquiring about the Curry Tuck County Game Commission laws. And I, I think they do a pretty good job of administering their, their game commission there in Dare County as well. Do we have all the bush blinds now GPSed in terms of the coordinates? We do have all the all the bush blinds GPSed, and uh, the game commission is uh, going to get GPS locations for the point blinds. And I'll, I will say that having those GPS locations, it, having them in place, is very important. And it may that may be one factor that's caused you to hear a little bit less about issues with the game commission because it instead of it being um, one person coming in and saying, "Well, that blind's been there for 20 years," but now we have a GPS location, say, so "We know the GPS location, and it's it's 75 yards or 100 yards away from the spot where you're saying the blind has historically been," and also. Uh, aerial photos and access to aerial photos is is um, much greater now than, than probably ever has been, and that's that's something there. But that's um, since I've been the attorney, that's one thing that we've dealt with pretty consistently is these changing locations of bush blinds and to some extent point blinds, and that that's resolving itself because we're getting our our GPS locations are more and more refined, so it's working better. Good. I just want to say you guys do a really good job. I know Andy, when I put Andy on the board, it was, it was uh, um, I've duck hunted a bunch of times with Andy. We're friends. And when I you know, look into your appointment of who I want to put on somebody, and Andy, I asked him if he'd be interested. He was like, it was like I was giving him a, you know, a job. He was so excited. But, he, but you've done a phenomenal job as well as Bill. And, I mean, like, like Commissioner uh, Etheridge said, I remember when I was a commissioner before, I got some nasty phone calls about duck blinds, and I don't get them anymore, so thank you all. Any other questions from the board? Does that conclude your presentation, gentlemen? Yes, the all right. To thank you. Thank you for coming. Up. Thank Appreciate you all. that. Thank you. All right. The next order of business is new business, and we have consideration of resolution establishing the board of commissioners' regular meeting days and time. And I believe that's going to be our attorney, Mr. Ike McCree. Mr. Chairman, at, your, at the board's retreat two weeks ago, you, you discussed whether to change your <coughs> meeting uh, times from 6 o'clock on the first and third Monday of each month to 6 o'clock on the first Monday and 3 o'clock p.m. in the afternoon. 
on the, sec uh, on the third Monday of the month. Uh, pursuant to the general statutes, the Board of Commissioners must hold at least one regular meeting per month, uh, and it is up to the Board of Commissioners to determine by resolution its time and place of its regular meetings. Uh, and then if you are to change your regular meeting uh, time or, or, or day or place, uh, that must also be uh, published at least 10 days prior to the first date of the change in your regular meeting schedule. So before you tonight is a resolution that, for your consideration, uh, that would, if adopted, change your uh, regular meeting uh, days, well, times, uh, to 6 o'clock p.m. on the first Monday of every month and 3 o'clock p.m. on the third Monday of every month, uh, beginning March 1st, 2021. Be glad to answer any questions. What was the purpose of the change? Can you explain that for the second meeting to the uh, There was some discussion uh, among the board and staff uh, about, first of all, the length of, of meetings um, and, and uh, specifically with regard to uh, planning matters uh, and use permits um, that require evidentiary hearings and depending on the nature of the case and the number of witnesses and the amount of evidence uh, could cause a meeting to run uh, much later into the evening uh, than a board might desire and some discussion about whether uh, the board might be making some of its best decisions if, if meetings are running late into the evening. I mean, the board has, uh, not particularly this one, but there have been instances where this board has had meetings run until 2 o'clock in the morning, um, depending on the type of case that might be before it. So that was uh, one consideration that was, that was discussed. Another consideration that was discussed by the board uh, was also, again, with regard to use permit proceedings, uh, there is the uh, requirement that experts testify on, on a couple of the elements uh, for a use permit to be uh, granted. Uh, and so there was some discussion and belief that perhaps an earlier start time uh, on the third Monday of the month uh, would allow for use permits to be placed on that agenda would allow for uh, experts, uh, whether they be attorneys or engineers or, or other uh, parties that are brought in by the applicant, would, would have the ability uh, to uh, appear during regular work hours in essence uh, and not run them late into the evening as well uh, with a presentation of a case that, that may go much later than had been anticipated, expected, or desired. So basically, it's a citizen. It might it might it might save an applicant some fees for for experts or other witnesses that might be necessary for them to present their case to the board. Did we not have? Uh, it's not common practice for counties, uh, particularly around us, to have an earlier one of their meetings earlier, or even just one in some cases, one meeting a month, but. Uh, it, quite it a few is, counties. Uh, Derrick County, for example, has, a more, has one meeting a month in the morning. Uh, the, the second one begins at 5 o'clock in the afternoon. Um, when I was past Tank County attorney, I think they may have now gone to, to two night meetings, but at that time we had a 9 o'clock meeting in, uh, on the first Monday and uh, 7 o'clock on the, on the third Monday. Uh, most every beach town uh, has a one-day meeting a month, and the, their, their second meeting of the month is typically in the evening. Thank you. And, and the other thing, like far as the second meeting, if we have like a three o'clock, if we know something's going to be a, be at a sewer, be at a school, be at a something, I mean, is that something the county manager or we could possibly or the chairman, you know, if 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 we have six special use permits, I'm just shooting that out there as an example. If something we know is going to be a hot topic for something for a school or something, I mean, is that something we could put towards the, I mean, far as making the schedule or if you get a lot of emailed interest, I mean, where we make adjustments in the you know so people can attend if a citizen wants to attend because that's the only kickback I guess well we can always uh, amend the meeting when we come in if we know if it's first in the agenda we can move it to item six you know okay. instead of item one it's, it's easy enough to when we're in a meeting thank uh, you the county manager would like to and, and staff um, sends out you know a draft agenda to the board uh, before every meeting to just, just kind of check and make sure one that there's nothing missing that the board wanted to add on but also for the order of the um, items on the agenda. So that's definitely something that we can. I know we've we done that before. Through. I just wanted just so if somebody's 
watching from home or, you know, making comments on Facebook at 7 o'clock tonight or whatever. I mean, just so they know that that can be done. If some, you know, if somebody works in Virginia Beach and they get off at 4 and they can't get, you know, I mean, so like I said, if it's something important, they could, you know, still possibly make it because we can make adjustments. That was all on mine. Thank you. Do we have any other comments from the board? Yes, okay. Mr. Chairman. And uh, the first thing I'm going to say is um, I work uh, full-time supporting basically the Department of the Navy and the U.S. Navy. And um, they, especially in these days, have had to uh, extend their hours of support because under the COVID restrictions, uh, they're at half staffing uh, in the labs that uh, I interact with on a daily basis. And so consequently, our normal work day for the company that I work for is typically from seven until uh, at least six at night. And um, while I would like to say that it will be easy to attend meetings at three o'clock, the reality is I play a very pivotal role in the support of those contracts and um, that customer. And I can almost guarantee you that I will not be able to be at a 3 o'clock meeting. In reference to um, uh, quasi-judicial, as I understand it, if I miss the beginning of a meeting that is quasi-judicial, I cannot participate in any vote associated with that meeting because actually, I've missed actually, some of that evidence. Actually, you would be able, but so long as you – you had the opportunity to review the evidence presented during the course of the hearing that you missed. Okay, so describe to me how that might work. Well, I think we had a, an example not too long we ago did. with uh, Commissioner White uh, missed a meeting but was able to uh, review a video of, of the matter uh, and the evidence had been presented up to, up to that point of, of what he had missed and then he was able to participate in a vote ultimately on that particular application. So the experts that showed up for the first meeting were suggesting would not be open for cross-examination on my part when that meeting came up that I would be able to attend for the vote because clearly under those circumstances that and and I believe the reason why that meeting was kicked to another to the next week was because a majority could not be reached during that that Right. issue is that correct i think i think that was yes. one, one one reason um but, but, but you're correct you, you you of course if not present would not be able to question witnesses and elicit from them evidence that you might think uh, is important to the decision that you might make on the application uh, that bring, brings up a quick question then let's um just for an example we had a quasi-judicial meeting where a commissioner was absent um, at that third meeting of the month. Um, could we then reschedule the vote to take place at the first meeting of the month as long as the, the missing commissioner had time to to um, review the evidence? Could we take the vote at the first or would it have to be at the third one again? Certainly. It's, it's up to the okay. board. And, so. and in your discretion as when you, you desire to take the okay. vote, you're not required to take a vote the, the very <clears throat> evening that the hearing okay. is held. So, so we could schedule for the next, then that vote to take place in the first, when all the commissioners are here then. You okay. could. Okay. But, but the point was, as uh, Commissioner Etheridge brought up, that would be Kitty Etheridge, <laughs> stage left. Um, we were talked about expenses that could be saved by starting and finishing in a single day, and now we're talking about bringing everybody back for a second day. So I would, I would suggest... No, that, I don't. I didn't until yeah, you would though. just take a vote. You wouldn't go through. It would just well, be. A, and, and that's even if if the board felt it was necessary. Yeah. I mean, if it's not a very controversial thing, and you didn't feel like the entire complement of the board was needed, it just goes through, and it goes through whatever the vote is, unless it ends up in a tie, which happened when I was not here. That one was a. If I, if my memory was that a three to three tie, and he was. Yeah, the, I was. The yes, side. that's correct. Okay, that's what I thought. Can so, I ask Mr. Beaumont, would it? be more convenient for you if it started at four I, it, is it more convenient at four than at three you think yes it? it is more convenient at four than it is three and um, that I would mean, work better for it, you 
Yes, because the work day is the work day. That does not guarantee that I'll be here at 4 o'clock either. Um, my concern is that evidence is presented that, um, and I, you know, there are issues that I, you know, call it my engineering background, call it whatever, that, that are logical for me to follow a question from an evidentiary perspective that I feel I will lose out on that ability to, to respond. Certainly I understand that other coastal communities have an earlier meeting a month. I'm curious how, and I've not seen, or and, and maybe we have a list of events or issues that would come before the board that would fall under that earlier meeting that could be, you know, that would be considered routine in nature or whatever. But, um, you know, that's my problem or my personal issue, but there's also a, another issue, and that's with the residents of the county. Um, you know, they can't watch live on the meeting. It, well, at least most places of employment aren't going to let you sit there and watch a video conference while you're supposed to be working. So they're going to miss out on the live. Clearly, we, we typically record, and that's available as, as a uh, backup. But, you know, we risk um, people not being able to participate, you know, and that's, that's the bottom line. Um, I, I did get – there was a ping on Facebook, and, um, and my response was, you know, the meetings used to start at 7. We moved them to 5, and then we moved them back to 6. And, and my comment on Facebook was there was not a significant level of participation gained or lost as that meeting moved that way. People typically are able to schedule that so that they can participate. I fear 3 o'clock. That, that is – there's a lot of employers out there that aren't going to let their employees off at 2 o'clock in the afternoon uh, to come and participate. So, well, how do they go to DMV? How do they go to the doctor? I mean, we do a, a bazillion things during normal working hours from 9 to 5. And because we're a, a elected body, now we can't do business during normal business hours. I mean, people find ways to do things in their lives if it's important enough to them to do that. And I just, you know, it's it, you're... We, and maybe it's because of COVID, but in the last four years I've sat here, we, we really have seen participation and audience participation drop off significantly. No, Very few people come to public comment anymore. Um, maybe, and I don't know, you know, obviously under COVID, under, since March of this year, that, you know, that's, that's reasonable to assume that that's going to happen. But I just don't see how, you know, all, it happens everywhere that people go to these meetings around us and it, it, you know it's it's I just I'm, people are well, able to pull stuff off and 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 whether they watch it live or not doesn't affect anything either whether they can watch it live or understand. recorded but and, and hence I started off by how it influences me personally right um, the other thing I would suggest is that we've had two work sessions recently where because of the perceived workload that work session started significantly earlier than we typically do. Mm -hmm. And in both instances, we wound up finishing significantly earlier than, you know, and I, and I understand being conservative on the county manager's part and not wanting to, to um, you know, run out of time while discussing an issue. The problem is I can always end a me I can always end a meeting early. I can't always start a meeting late, specifically with the public notice requirements that we're required to publish. Um, I'll, one of the changes, and I think uh, I, this was as you as the attorney under the Board of Adjustments, was that we made a policy that, and I can't remember the time, that no, no case, no new case would start, was it nine or 10? Um, it may have been 10 for the Board of Adjustment. And of course, Planning Board has a similar rule. <laughs> so literally, if the meeting is going to exceed Whatever that time is, 10 o'clock in the Board of Adjustment, the Board took a vote to determine whether or not they were going to proceed past 10 o'clock and whether or not they were going to hear any further cases. So I can always cut off a meeting, but we've had things cancel at the last minute that, you know, again, it, the meeting, and I want to say the last Board of Commissioners meeting we had wound up not taking as long as we expected again. It's easier to, to end a meeting earlier, but you can't start it late. 
And, and, then, so, and then what? I'm sorry? If you cut a meeting off at 10 o'clock and we're going to have another hour and a half, say we'll be here till 1130, when, what do you do then? I think that option is up for the board. They can, can, uh, they can uh, continue it to another meeting or, it, I mean, that is an option. Yeah. Right. And I think about that, play that out. So I actually tried that when I was chair to, uh, we, were, we were getting into 10.30 or so, and it was going to be another hour, hour and a half. We were going to be here. We were actually were here until almost midnight that night. And um, the council couldn't be here for the, for the person. You know, we're asking the engineer to figure out their schedule again, all the witnesses that may be coming forward. So, you know, it, 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 it sounds good up front, but in the end it doesn't work. And that's one of the reasons why we were looking at doing this earlier is so that we can have these meetings play out that are going to take six hours, get them done in one shot, and not have all this other stuff going on where we might have to, to change a meeting or not make a good decision. I would, I would just say that I really value Commissioner Beaumont's uh, questions and opinions uh, on especially matters that take a an engineering and a deep scientific background and um, I, I understand uh, the concern about starting at three um, you know in my former life as a school teacher uh, three o'clock would have been an impossibility for me to be able to attend a meeting so I do empathize with that three o'clock start um, I, I understand why we need a three o'clock start but if it's going forward going to be an uh, impossibility for Commissioner Beaumont to be here. Um, I think we need to, like uh, Commissioner Etheridge said, maybe a 4 o'clock start. Uh, anything that can accommodate us being effective, I think that's, that's the main thing here. We want to make good decisions. We want to make thorough decisions and questioning is an important part of that and digesting that information is a imp important part of that so I think that's something to consider um, in this Th resolution thank you and mr. Styler how many meetings how many six-hour cases have we had I mean I cuz I know we've had a couple but what, what we've seen um, historically is that I don't know that it's one you're saying cases or meetings have we had? Well, as Long Commissioner uh, White had suggested, we had a six-hour case. We don't want to have to move it to a, the next day or a different meeting. I don't, I don't know how many individual cases we've had that have gone six hours. And in, in my brief time here, we've had several nights that that ran um, five to six hours. But I don't, I don't keep track of it. Um, I'm here at your discretion, so I stay here until you all tell me to go home. So I don't, I don't really... It gets late, but I don't pay attention to we it. We were here until you told us to go home. Yeah. Well, no, let me just, one of the concerns I'll express, and, and I've sat through numerous meetings since 2014 um, as, as um, Commissioner Beaumont, and there have been some late nights. And recently, you know, you know I, I'm sitting here, I look around, 1030, and there's a lot of yawning going on. There's a lot of nodding. Some eyes are getting heavy. And one of my concern is, is are, we, are we fair then to the applicant at that time frame if we're not fresh-minded, listening to everything, and in our minds, gosh, when's this going to get over? When's this going to get over? I'm ready to go home. And giving them the same due process as we would see somebody at 5 o'clock more nice and fresh. And, you know, and then all of a sudden we go through two um, – two items and then we're looking oh gosh it's nine o'clock and we got another one and a half to two more to go and what's our mindset how are we thinking are we really focusing are we giving them the same due diligence as we did the previous ones and that's what my concern is because you know it just you know, like was stated before I think people are getting tired um, it's getting late and I'm not sure if it's the um, you know if, if going late meetings is really fair either so do we do we do we start a little early to try to help with that? Help with uh, the commissioners and the individuals coming so we're not so late? Do we do more meetings? Which, I mean, I don't know if that's going to solve the problem either. Um, but if we keep them at 6 o'clock, 
I mean, I understand concerns, and we've always had them that way, but you go 6 o'clock, and, and we have some lengthy quasi-judicial ones, 10 o'clock is not out of sight with, with a 6 o'clock start, by all means. By the time we get to the regular agenda and then start with those. So, I mean, that, that's what we're looking at. Okay, so <laughs> a four-hour meeting is determined to be pushing it. Is that what you're No, suggesting? no, no, no. I'm saying you just said six o'clock we start and ten o'clock I said is, is not a not is not unreachable. I didn't say that was the endings time. I just said ten o'clock is not is very possible to be reached and beyond and that's when I think ten, ten thirty is when you start seeing the eyes get heavy and I see nodding mm -hmm. and going on like that and I start getting hit by ten, ten thirty and I've seen it quite often. Okay. Well, see, <laughs> not, no, I didn't say right. I didn't say a four o'clock meeting is on a I just said that's going to be the minimum. We're going to be easily hitting 10 o'clock. Could go well into that, and that's when you start seeing the nodding and the eyes get heavy, and and it's just you know that's my concern is is it you know the the the, the applicant sees that, the audience sees that, and well, they're and, feeling it too. Well, I know they're feeling it too, and then they're wondering, well, gosh, why wasn't that why wasn't I up front first? So everybody's wide awake. Right. Now I got the first. now I got the 10 o'clock assignment, and everybody's yawning and nodding back there, so. And uh, another <laughs> key piece of it is our staff. You know, they're here, they're out, they're going to community meetings on top of what they do here, planning board <laughs> meetings. The planning board meeting, the last one went, what, three and a half hours? Um, you know, the county attorney's got to Forward do his forward. thing, and Ben was at the planning board meeting, so they're, it's part of the job description, but at the same time, we're not getting the best out of them the following day, for certain. Um, I know I'm not probably at my no. peak the next day no, dragging around and so. you know and, and no and, and i own a business I, i'm in you know when it's heating and air conditioning it's summertime when it's 100 degrees outside and i got to come in early for meetings is it painful yeah but yeah i do what needs to be done it's it's hard <clears throat> it's, but, I, but i understand you know yes, is, sir. is four o'clock something that's on the table i know when i had actually wrote that down at the bottom of my sheet and uh, Commissioner Jarvis, as well as Commissioner Hetheridge, you know, says, I mean, is it? I think so. I mean, that's a really I think four or five, five. I just right. think we should try to start a little earlier on these, just to give the to, to give the time needed, and 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 you know, so we're all nice and awake. I mean, we could still start at four o'clock and still go to eleven. So the final comment I would throw out there is, <laughs> is it the time of day that gets tiring and wearisome, or is it the amount of hours spent? listening to the cases and the details associated with those because I would argue it's the amount of detail and it's not going to matter if it's a six hour meeting that starts well there was probably a little bit but a six hour meeting or a case that starts at three o'clock is going to feel just about the same as one that starts later than that and and I get time of day and the whole circadian rhythm and all that kind of stuff but I I, I just you know the, the other risk is if, if we can't be creative in scheduling, you know, things that, um, you know, I might go for or might be contrary, you know, might get scheduled in the beginning of the meeting, and that's a perception that this board is going to have to figure out how to overcome it because right now, you know, I, I again, I, I will do my best to be here, but this entire county elected me to be part of these meetings, and if, you know, that. I'd like to be retired. I'd like to have control over my daily destiny, but I do not have that. And so I, all I have is what, you know, my regular job gives me. So <clears throat> that's all. Any other comments from the board? Because, um, well, let me ask the board then. It sounds like we had a suggestion to change the 3 o'clock p.m. start time to the 4 o'clock start time. Um, is there any... Any feedback regarding that, or does that sound more in line with what the board is looking to do? Um, I'm good with it. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a step in the right direction as far as. I mean, it sounds like to me I got the majority of the board nodding that 4 o'clock would be an acceptable start time if we change this resolution from 3 o'clock to 4 o'clock. Oh, and you've been rather static over any there. Any feedback any over there, Mr. Etheridge? Or? Well... <laughs> I've heard from a lot of citizens that we're shutting them out of participation. I've also looked at it from all sides. Bob hit it on it correctly. We're here at 1130, 12 o'clock at night. Staff still got to be here at 8 o'clock next morning. 
So it's got its pros and cons. I know when I first came on the board, we started at 7, and we went after midnight many nights, mm -hmm. <clears throat> many nights. <coughs> Is that being fair to everybody? Because the public's not going to sit here that long. So maybe four is the good, the good alternative. Just for the second meeting, the first meeting is going to stay as the same. Yes. And, the, same and the public comment, I guess you're only, re technically you're only required public comment once a month. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so, but we're going to, we go beyond that. We do it at every meeting. So the public comment is still going to be available out there. And the le legislative meeting, the first meeting of the month is going to stay the same. And then, and I would add that you know we can adjust when public comment is in the order of business so for our second meeting if that is a concern and you know to allow the public in other than they may want to come speak on an agenda item in public comment that they can't speak to in that agenda item but we can open uh, up public comment later in the meeting itself set it as a, as a later agenda a part of the agenda so um to let people come in and mm -hmm. and and uh, my understanding is that some people made the comment, well, if, if public comment is later on in the afternoon, they can't speak on an item. Right. Well, if it's a quasi-judicial item anyways, we can't take that as evidence unless they're sworn in. Right. So uh, yeah, on that part of it, is that, that's correct, right? Yes. Correct. So, um, so the public comment during the third meeting of the month would not affect any decisions on the quasi-judicial because it has to be expert and right. it's got to be sworn in. Right. That's, so that's that would allow them then to come in and speak on anything they wanted to at that point later on. Mm -hmm. <coughs> the the other thing I would throw out, sorry, this is my final final. Yeah. Um, and you're talking about public comment at some point on a 3 o'clock meeting. Um, <coughs> the ha I know where you're going. But that gonna be I, know, I knew where you were going. if you have a six-hour <coughs> meeting this, this time, that's 9 o'clock, a six-hour meeting <coughs> next time, I mean, if they get done in four hours now, public meeting, you missed their public comment, you missed it. So they're either going to have to wait until whenever that 3 o'clock meeting public comment ends or we need to try and figure out how you're going to schedule it because that's not fair to the people that would want to come and speak because you're not going to really be able to tell them what time that's going to be. No, you're not. But if somebody just wants to generally speak about topics throughout the county, um, if we have, if we still had the the uh, the, the six o'clock meeting, if I just wanted to come in at one meeting and just discuss about how I feel about the trash sites or the roads in the county, I could still come in at any first of the meeting of the month, public comment, and speak my piece, and I don't have to wait till the third meeting of the month to do that. I could do that at the first meeting, get that over with, and then I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm get off work at normal time to be there. If I want to speak in a matter about a quasi-judicial then I could see the agenda items and know it's fourth on the list and I need to get here and sign up but I got to get sworn in I got to be an expert opinion so I, I agree public comment we can't say okay it's going to be at six o'clock on this second meeting of the month because you're right you're not going to be able to align that up during the middle of the meeting so I mean I, I understand that but still the first meeting a month allows anybody to come in at six o'clock and say whatever they want to <coughs> And they're still free and open to make their comments on Facebook, too. So, I mean, they still got that option. More public comment happening there, for well, sure. Well, I mean, it's just, I, and again, the, the first meeting of the month is not going to change. Public right. comment, right. I mean, at 6 o'clock, public's going to come in there. They can say what they want to. We give them the time to speak um, without us commenting back. And then the second meeting, um, you know, we're going to take care of the, uh, the, 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 the excuse me, the quasi-judicial stuff. And I think... I, I get and this board mm -hmm. has been overly uh, conscientious of allowing people to speak their minds and hear them out mm -hmm. um, even even so going so far as to let them come back up um, after well they uh, missed it yeah because yeah, we're not taking a, yeah. a, done that before. a valuable yeah. time away the first meeting of the month mm -hmm. that the public comments still going to stay in place and they have all the ample time they can come to the first meeting of the month every month if they'd like to speak and that's not changing Bottom line, whatever time we pick is not going to suit 100% of the people. We're going to have to pick one that is works for 
the uh, most. Oh, and it never has. No. Nope. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, with what Mr. Etheridge said, I move that we establish our meeting time starting March the 1st. Our regular first Monday meeting will be at 6 o'clock, and the third Monday of each month will start at 4 p.m., and it will be held here in the courthouse. Okay, we have a motion um, with, for the, the legislative first meeting to stay as is, and the second meeting quasi just starting at 4 p.m. Do I have a second? I'll second that. All right, do we have any further discussions? Okay, then all in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Nay. Okay, motion carries six to one. Okay. All right. Okay. The next item is consideration of ordinance amending section 2-65 of the Currituck County Code of Ordinance providing for the location of old business and public hearings on the Board of Commissioners agenda. And that we have our attorney Ike McCree again. This was also an item that the board discussed during your retreat two weeks ago. Um, currently, public uh, hearings are held or, and located on your agenda prior to old business. Uh, it was suggested that it might make uh, more sense and be a, a better use, particularly to the public, uh, to go ahead and, and handle old business uh, left over from a prior meeting and then enter into your public hearing business. And so before you is an ordinance amendment to amend the code of ordinances that establishes the order of business for your agenda that would provide again for old business to appear on your agenda prior to public hearings. I'll remind you that because this is the first reading of this ordinance tonight, it would necessitate a unanimous vote for it to be adopted. If there is not a unanimous vote tonight, it would come back to you at another meeting at which time it may be adopted by a simple majority vote. Okay. Mr. Board Chairman, I'll move to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any other further discussions? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Uh, carries unanimously. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. The next item is item C, board <clears throat> appointments. Um, we have some planning board appointments listed for tonight. Do we have any? Mr. Chairman, um, my appointment uh, has <coughs> said she wishes to step down, so I'm oh. in the process of finding someone okay. else. Okay, gotcha. Well, that's the only board appointments we had on the planning board uh, was for tonight, so uh, was there any other board appointments that, nope. okay. All right, that being said, then the next item of new business is a consent agenda. We have any discussions on the consent agenda? Move for approval, Mr. Chairman. I'll second it. I have a motion and second. Any further discussions on the consent agenda? If not, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. And with that, I am going to recess from our normal meeting and move to enter into closed session <clears throat> pursuit to GS 143-318.11A3 to consult with the county attorney and to preserve the attorney-client privilege and to consult with the county, county attorney and preserve, uh, preserve the attorney-client privilege in the matter entitled 85 and Sunny LLC versus Curta County and pursuit to GS 143-318.11A6 to discuss a personnel matter. <clears throat> Any other questions? You want to call for a vote? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? <laughs> okay, thank you.